Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we've already done uh, a video for a snatch and the optimal bar path, but we did it on IGTV. This is going to be for YouTube, of course, if you're watching it, it's on YouTube. But we're going to go a little bit more in depth. It just the, the layout makes it a little bit easier for me. So without further ado, let's get into it. In the other video, we of course, we talked about the four major bar paths. Now, these are the bar, uh, bar paths as uh, defined by Kyle Pierce and Dr. Stone. They did this study. Uh, they did the 2015 uh, World Championships, which were in Houston, and the 2017 uh, Pan American Championships, which were in Florida. Well, no, in, in the Everglades, to be exact. I was there. It was a, it was a nice uh, venue. It rained a lot. But anyway, so they... There's obviously more bar paths, but these are the four most common that they noticed, you know, when they uh, when they did the research. And obviously, what they did is they looked at several variables and came up with these four. And I'll I'll tell you those variables in a few minutes towards the end of this. But you will find that most people will, will fall in one of these four, and if they're way outside it, then they just have a lot of work to do because these are the four most common. You know, as it was at the A session of those two major international competitions. Anyway, a few little things to note before we get started. You know, in the A session, the athletes, both men and women, de demonstrated a type 3 bar path, which is right there. And they did that, uh, was it 53% of the time at the World Championships and 59% of the time at the Pan American Championships. So that is... a. Uh, if there's, I'll go ahead and tell you, if there's somewhere, your athletes are somewhere in between the type three and the type two, then, you know, they're on a good track. And then probably at that point, you know, focus on just, you know, speed and strength and less on technique. But technique will always be something that will be an ongoing process. Anyway, so the medalist um, demonstrated the type three 43% of the time at the World Championships and 49% of the time at the Pan American Championships. The women medalists uh, demonstrated type 2 50% of the time. Um, and that was at the World Championships and 39% of the time at the Pan American Championships. So, that's you know, if you're you know coaching a female or even the males, which we'll talk about in a minute, but, you know, the type 2, type 3, they're both... You know, they're both very good. And, it's, you know, somewhere in between is probably the best, you know, uh, place to be. But definitely either one is, is a bar path that will be consistent and will be able to produce high lifts. Now, if you were, if you're a man and you're in that heavyweight category, you know, well, now things are a little different than now than it was back then. Used to, it was 105 and then heavyweight. Now we have the 102, uh, 109, and then heavyweight. So anywhere around 102 and heavier, you might want to look at, you know, working towards this type three. And you might probably won't have a choice. Like, um, you know, Morgan McAuliffe is a, he's a young uh, well, he's a junior now, but he's still only 17. But he's going to demonstrate more of a type 3. Uh, he's not going to be anywhere near, you know, a type 2. It's just he's tall. And so, like, you know, I don't think that a bigger guy, unless they're just, like, overweight, but, like, I'm talking about a muscular, he's going to make it to the, you know, become a medalist someday in the Olympics. They're going to be a type 3 simply because they're going to have longer limbs. You know, they're going to have longer uh, tibias. That's why they're six foot one or, or taller. Um, so there's not a whole lot you're going to be able to do about that. And sometimes you'll drive your athletes crazy trying to get them to do something that they're really not capable of. And the amount of, you know, you'd have to go so slow to get something similar to this type two that what you would lose in velocity, you would not gain from a, a, you know, a better center of gravity. So anyway, so don't fight, you know, what God has given them. All right. Now, let's take a look at each of them. Uh, I look at type 1. It's going to be more of an inconsistent. You know, I will say after type 2 and type 3, you know, that's the, that was the third most common amongst those A-session lifters in those two big events. And then with type 4 being the, the least, you know, common. So a good thing. Uh, the thing they have going for them is a good start. As you can see, you know, they're very similar to the type 2. And really, most people would think that that's a better start than even the type three. You know, the key is they're 
what it is is they're just able to. You know, their lower legs are, and their arms are proportioned to the point where it's easy to get the bar coming back. However, instead of continuing that drive, you know, continuing to push with the legs, driving the whole foot through the floor, what they're going to do is they're going to move behind the bar too soon, and they're going to move horizontal. And so, you know, they got the bar coming back. However, you see it's not as far back as, you know, as a type two. And so what they're doing is they're going ahead and coming forward, and ex instead of extending up, and slightly back, they're getting behind the bar and going behind the bar, which is forcing a more, you know, horizontal displacement of the barbell. Now, so like, you know, what causes that? You know, well, it could be, when I say neural dysfunction, that sounds like a disease. What I'm just saying is like, you know, their patterns are off. You know, they've been taught or they just naturally, you know, got behind the bar too soon. I think a lot of problems is that people watch YouTube videos and they see somebody lift and they think they're banging the hips into the bar and really it's just a natural occurrence you know you're standing up you're sweeping the bar close and then when you're in that power position that natural power position the bar is is somewhere in that cre crease of the hips and then when they extend it's a, more of an uppercut however if you leave the bar out in front or if you really push your hips into the bar it's going to go horizontal and that's not what you want go with that's going to cause a bigger loop of the barbell so you're going to you're either miss it out front because you push it out front or you're going to try to loop it back to to make it and that that the bigger that top loop which we're going to talk about it in a minute the bigger that thing is the more inconsistent you're going to get a lot of misses behind if you've ever had an athlete that misses behind a lot that's probably the bar path that they demonstrate so some things you can um, you might might be the causes would be once again the neural pattern is off uh, weak torso and posterior chain meaning they cannot stay with that push you know they're going to try to move behind the bar because you know their back doesn't feel strong and by back i mean you know those external you know the the back extensors you know the erectors the erector spinae so whatever keeps your back in extension those muscles are not strong enough you know, or, you know, their, their hamstrings, because like the, the longer you stay in that drive, you know, the length, the hamstrings are getting longer. So if you're more of a quad dominant person, then the body will automatically start to move behind because it knows you're not strong in the quads. And so it's going to go to where it's strong, which if you're quad dominant, that's what's going to happen. So, um, to fix that, uh, isometrics, you know, like pauses in the pull, um, against pins, and uh, what I recommend, instead of going through major phases of pauses or major phases of, you know, lots of different types of movement, by doing more of a, you know, a pause at the knee or a pause a few inches off the ground and then do that maybe two reps and on a third rep do a full rep. So, like, by mixing in those isometric pauses with, you know, a normal concentric type lift, that I have found that the pattern, you know, that the patterns that are developed end up being a little, little bit better. So, but that's just a suggestion. There's no absolute. Um, slow eccentrics, meaning, you know, doing hangs is something that Piers Dimas recommended to us. So we might do the low hangs, which are b below the knee, with a five, sec five to six second eccentric, just teaching the body and strengthening the body where it should be so when you go slower number one you can think about the angle of your torso you can make corrections the coach can cue you and you can make those corrections so and then frequency just if there's something that you're not doing if snatch is something that you're not doing well at increase the frequency i think that's something that uh, crystal did, coach crystal mccullough uh, did for for Morgan and it was a big payoff by simply putting in snatch more often and more you know more frequently than um the cleaner jerks or the cleans I think she did a good job of doing the jerks and the snatches at a higher rate than the cleans because that's what he needed to work in uh type two you know that's a a good start to things um balanced anthropometrics normally you know they're gonna um, the athlete has no problem staying over the bar longer in that first pull, meaning, you know, they can push their legs and then they're not trying to get behind too soon because they feel weak or, or because they're quad dominant. They have an optimal torso angle uh, in relation to the floor, you know, somewhere between 45 degrees, give or take five either way. And the key you don't want to get is parallel. So if you find yourself, you know, parallel to the ground, you know, that's when you're going to end up with a type four, which we'll show you in a minute. 
Um, torso angle allows for easy sweep to the bar. You know, at about 45 degrees, you know, that moment, the uh, shoulder flexor moment isn't so great of a demand that you can't easily uh, extend at the, at the shoulder using the lats to keep the bar close. So vertical finish with the horizontal follow through. Yeah, when they're demonstrating this bar path, they're finishing up slightly back and under. They're not pushing their hips too far. You know that, if, especially if you're a female, you want to, you want to work towards this. Unless you're really tall, then you know type three might be your better bet. All right. All right, here's a little bit better view, I think, anyway, so, um, and let me, yeah, all right, so I look at type three, it's, normally these athletes have a longer lower leg, you know, that tibia, fibia, um, and or the, the arms are short, but normally it's just, you know, they're just long in the area, and so, you know, that distance from the floor to the knee is just not enough time to be getting the bar way in close and getting the knees out. What would happen to do that, they, their butt would fly up to do that, and that's not good. So they got to maintain optimal torso angle. Um, they need to drive through the entire foot the majority of the time, staying over the bar, able to sweep back, starting around the knee, and then the vertical finish with slight horizontal um slightly horizontal finish so you know they're not able to you know obviously they can't get back too soon and sometimes it's going to go out this is definitely a, a morgan um, bar path and that's fine you know snatched 150 kilos at 17 so um that's a that's an okay thing where we fought forever to have him do more of a type two you know you know now we know that he doesn't have to he just you know as soon as he can he needs to get the bar moving back and he needs to stay with it um Sorry, and he needs to stay with uh, with the leg drive as long as possible. He does that. He does a really good job at staying through his entire foot, even in the finish, and thinking about finishing uh, vertical with a slight horizontal finish. He's definitely not trying to get behind the bar too soon. Anyway, uh, the final one and the one that causes I think the most issues. Is a look at type four. It's the most inconsistent. I think we got to be careful in America because we always talk about a vertical bar path. And as you can see, that number one, there is no such thing. And number two, by really, you know, by forming a vertical bar path, which is more what type four looks like, you know, you're leaving the bar out front. That's a well, we'll go over those major issues and then I'll talk a little bit deeper in depth about it. But the poor start with a major shift in the torso angle almost becoming more, more almost parallel to the floor. That's happening right out the gate. What they're doing is they're leaving the bar out in front. You know, they're going to, you know, initiate the pull. However, their butt's going to fly up and almost instantly there's a change in angle. And what happens, number one, is you don't get that acceleration because normally if you keep that good torso angle you're driving with your legs you're using that knee extension to to get you know as much velocity as possible remember impulse the longer you can stay with that first pull the more velocity you can create from that you know initial drive so if they're if your knees are immediately extending and your butt's flying up well the bar's not moving very much because all that's moving is your torso angle so think about, you know, locking that thing in. If it changes a little bit, that's fine, but it needs to stay somewhere at 45 degrees. So what they're doing, they're leaving the bar in front. It results in slower velocity and it ends up being higher demands on the hips and the back. Anywhere, you know, at any intervertebral joint, it, it causes it to be more of a demand and more stress. So that's going to lead to a lot of misses in front. You know, it causes just a bad pattern. A lot of times, most of the time, y'all, you know, it's a bad pattern. Um, however, the thing that you know corrects the pattern is probably the same thing that fi fixes a weakness. Uh, the other weakness would be a weak torso, uh, weak posterior chain, or just you know I don't know if it's necessarily weak as much as the quads are dominant. I guess it's you know it's the same thing, but you know you might have a strong posterior chain, it's just you might have unbelievably strong quads, which is, uh, is one of the reasons why I think. Um, our man Sean Hamill is just he's super strong quads 
and we just need to catch up that posterior chain. So it isn't necessarily weak, it's just he's crazy strong, you know, the anterior portion of his body. Anyway, to fix it, you know, isometrics, you know, pauses in the pull, uh, pauses against the pin, uh, slow eccentrics, and frequency. The same as with type 1. It's um, number one, you know, work on correcting those patterns by slowing things down a little bit and then just increasing frequency. And so I would, uh, it's not an easy fix. You guys aren't going to fix it in four weeks. If you're type four, you're not going to go type four to type two or even type four to type three in a day or a few weeks. It's going to be an ongoing battle. Look at, you know, correcting it over six months, a year. And I would, what I would do is leave certain, you know, like um, pauses, you know, slow eccentrics, leave it even the last four weeks before competition, leave it in the warm-ups. That's okay. And then just, you know, as it gets heavier, start to, you know, go back to your normal snatch. Or, well, an improved normal snatch. So that would be my advice. Let's see. I've got a, one more slide I want to show you is the important aspects of the pull. I think uh, they did a good job, Dr. Stone, Dr. Pierce, and the whole gang. Those are just the two that I happen to know. But... There's a few important portions that they have labeled that I'm going to teach you guys about. Like you've, you've heard a lot of coaches will talk about the original vertical line. If you look at the, let me see something. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Um, yeah. So if you look, look at this dotted line, that's the original um, vertical line that, that we're going to, it's the, the vertical reference line. It's an imaginary line that takes into consideration where the bar starts and drives. And from there, you draw a vertical line straight up through the you know, top of the universe. The key is to stay behind that at all times. Now, as you remember, if you, look at, if you looked at the, um, the type 3 bar path, you know, most tall guys with, with uh, long lower limbs are going to go in front of that. Not just tall guys, sorry, tall girls. Or just you don't have to necessarily be tall. You just happen to have longer lower legs in proportion to the rest of your body so some of the keys is this is that x1 and that, what that is that's a measurement between that original vertical um, reference line and the most rearward rearward horizontal displacement that the bar is going to have when it where it meets the body so the greater that angle is the easier you've made it on the hips and the back and um the greater you get from the floor to there, it's just it's going to be faster, easier. So the closer distance leads to less demand on the hips and back. And the X2 is probably even more important because remember the type 3 does not have as big of a you know X1 angle that as does the type 2. So but what's really important is this X2. It's like the difference in the distance between the most rearward horizontal displacement and the most anterior horizontal displacement because if that you know if you make contact and you either you left the bar out front and you pushed it more or even if you had this nice you know um, start but yet you pushed it horizontal meaning what would happen if someone were to have a beautiful pull like this and then the x2 went in front of that original vertical line what's happened instead of thinking about finishing up and then slightly back they just push their hips into the bar like uh, Piros would say humping the bar and so what would happen is at extension their shoulders are way behind the bar and they're going to extend way horizontal and yeah then you're going to get a major uh, a major x2 and then that loop too that is going to cause a major X loop because the bar has to get here. You know, where it finishes is where it finishes. You know, catch position, whether it's you know, directly over the ears or slightly behind that, which is, you know, a lot of people who are really good at snatch, it's a little bit behind the ears, more room for error. But that, where you catch is where you catch. So if you go way out in front, you're going to have to get way back. Either some people, you know, will, um, that's the way they compensate. You know, if uh, they push the body, if they push the bar horizontal to the anterior portion of the body, what they're going to do to compensate is jump forward. Anytime you got a major, any jump forward is, is bad, but it's because you've pushed the bar horizontal and you're trying to compensate, and that's going to create a lot of misses. It's really hard to be consistent when you do that. Now, the other one is like jumping back. When you look at this X net at the bottom, jumping back is not as bad you know what happens though is just you know that that means you have a major loop and you've compensated for that by jumping back a little bit uh, so 
jumping back in my experience you know does not create as many misses as jumping forward in a perfect world you want pretty much to your feet to just jump out and stay pretty much where they started however any kind any type of forward movement is a big no-no uh, slight back you know backwards movement is, is not as bad so in my experience so anyway uh, notice how the change oh yeah the center of mass changes throughout the pool if you notice that um, this little start is that pretty much the ball of the foot uh, somewhere between the ball and towards the middle as you pull that changes and the center mass is it's the you take the the weight in the very center of the mass of the barbell you take the center of the mass of, of the human and then in the middle of those two is the center mass of the unit so you have to take not just the barbell but the the body as well so as you move forward that center of mass is going to change so if you continue the best thing you could possibly do, if you continue to drive your entire foot through the ground, the center of mass and where it is and where the um, you know the the pressure is being placed by the feet onto the ground, where there is, will change naturally. If you just think about pushing that whole foot, having that good base, you know, having those toes pushed into the ground, nice solid base, pushing straight into the floor as long as possible, even to the all right, quickly, I'm just going to show you a few um, examples of bar path. Here's Hannah. And here's a bar path that she used to have. As you can see, she kind of mimics that type, you know, either a type 3 or a type 4, where it's not a lot of horizontal motion uh, movement at the beginning, you know, towards the rearward portion. And with her short lower legs, she should be able to do that. What causes, you know, what would, what that causes is ends up, major horizontal displacement so if you look at like the original vertical line yeah, she's pretty pretty far in front of that thing so we made some changes mainly had nothing to do with how strong it was simply increasing frequency um, slowing things down a little bit and now she got her coming back now there's a little bit of a change in the angle of her, of her torso which I think is something over overly taught in America. It's a little bit of a, of a shift, but she maintains a solid, you know, we would call that around 45 degrees, give or take, in relation to the floor. She keeps coming back. Now she's in a good position. Shoulders are on top of the bar. Now, definitely zero horizontal displacement. So, um, you can look, easily draw the line. Uh, not good. So, perfect. You know, it's more somewhere, I would call that a hybrid between type 2 and type 3. Now we got my man Trey. So do some of these markers. Now, obviously, this guy is strong. He's an incredible athlete, plays football for North Ryan University and very successful at his sport. He's, but he's also a weightlifter and um, he's been, lift, you know, he's been um, lifting for quite some time. Here he is off the ground. He demonstrates a perfect bar path. The bar is coming in. He's meeting the bar well. His feet are still flat at this point, but now here's where it goes wrong. Major horizontal displacement. So the bar moves in front. That's going to mimic that type one. Uh, still not bad, but the thing has nothing to do with strength. He, he did everything correct, so now he just needs to work on right here, finishing vertical and slightly back versus pushing his hips way forward and causing it. This is not a hard correction, which he's already corrected quite a bit. But now he's, he's killing it. Here's Sean. Now, he is, he's going to demonstrate the type four. So this is a little bit of everything. So now, you see that? That is his change in torso. See, he's pushing with the legs, and so, but nothing is happening. The bar is not moving. All that happened is he is now parallel to the ground. And so the bar pass stays out in front. It's vertical. And, you know, that vertical line we all talk about is not a good thing because now it's horizontal. So now he's out in front. It's easy to tell that he's out in front because 
his bar path was, you know, directly vertical. So that vertical reference line is shown fairly easily. And so, yeah, luckily he's got good mobility. He's got a very tight little uh, loop at the top, X loop. But what he does is miss a lot in front. And so, because he leaves the bar out in front. Uh, and I think it has a lot to do with uh, somewhat strength, even though he's a very strong. So by getting his posterior chain caught up with his anterior chain, I think is what he needs. Uh, and slowing things down. A little bit of all the different things we said. So more reps. More reps at pausing at the knee. More reps at pausing at the hip. Making sure he stays over and keeps the you know keeps the good torso angle. The big key is this: is off the floor. If you can maintain that torso angle a little bit better and keep the chest up. And then finally, here's Ryan. Let's see. All right, good start position. Pushes with legs. You know, um, he does start with his with a pretty. A little bit more than 45 degrees, he's probably like you know 60 or more, and you know so he's coming straight. He can't come back because you know that will he will run to his knees. But now he doesn't mean that he's going around the knees. If he's coming straight like that and now slightly back, he didn't go around. He still pushed his knees back. It's just he wasn't able to come back as much as some people. So now he's going to look somewhere of a hybrid between that type two and type three because his bar path still never goes in front. So that to me is still for Ryan, the perfect bar path. And it shows by his consistency. You know, if an athlete is consistent, then they probably have the bar path that's optimal for them. Finish. Anyway, I hope uh, this was a big help to you. And we're going to, I'm going to give acknowledgement, Dr. Stone, Dr. Pierce, you guys have done more for the sport of weightlifting, the field of strength and conditioning, and exercise science in general that any of us could do in, in three lifetimes. So I appreciate you. Thanks for making um, my life better and like helping me to make decisions as a coach and helping me to uh, keep from making mistakes that I would would have for sure made had I not had your work. So as a coach, athlete, and educator, thank you both. Bottom of my heart. And you guys... If you want, want, want to read more on this study, here it is. You guys can can look that up. And if you Google, you know, Kyle Pierce, Dr. Stone, Bar Path, it'll pop up every time the first time. So thank you guys for listening. And um, I'm going to give you some examples of everything we've talked about right after this. Thank you.